Any Crazy Carnivores, Meat Maniacs, and Dirty Butt Rubbers. It's Pitmaster Shane T. We're back again with Gorilla Live. And this week, there's nothing we're going to do other than jump right into it with the man, Mr. Malcolm Reed, because I know you got a thousand questions for him. So let's just jump right into it. Malcolm, how you doing today, brother? I'm good, Shane. How's it going, man? Dude, it's it's any day you get to talk about barbecue is a good day, man. Always a good day, right? Dude, we, we don't even get into the show and look at this. First first one right out the gate, man. You got to own this right here. I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. You and I have known each other for about 10 years now. I mean, you're having to start take credit for like half of what we do in barbecue now because, you know, most people have learned everything they know from how to barbecue right, man. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I try, man. I try, I try to spread the word, man. You do. You, you are the evangelist. The, uh, the 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 cooking soul brother from another mother bringing it every week, man. With those recipes, I always love your recipes. I always recommend them. Uh, in fact, your site, amazingribs.com, uh, are probably the two other barbecue sites I recommend most to anyone starting out in barbecue because I think the way you lay it out, the to it, I, I think it's great. It's easy accessible. But you've also got some upper end stuff. You, you, you kind of like me, where it's not everything can be. Uh, here's the ultra easy burger, right? You got to have some some fun stuff to, to 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 cook as well. I try to mix it up, but you know, I, I always my style is just like I'm sitting here talking to you cooking. I mean, I, I try to I try to keep it, you know, as as comfortable and as understandable as it can be. Right. Because when it comes down to it, barbecue is not complicated. I mean, you know, it's fire and smoke and time and temperature. That's all there is to it. So Right. Yeah, it, that's it. And and if one mistake is made is that people probably fret over it or care too much when they should be hands off a little more and enjoying it, right? Letting it cook. Yeah, man. That's that's the hardest thing to get somebody not to mess with the grill too much. Just that's, to, that's well, what do you say? Trust the swing on the grill? On hey, the that's right. I, I need that shirt. I got, I got you. Got to burn to learn. I need trust the swing. That's my next shirt. Man. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a good shirt. I I, I need to this do it. You said here in the podcast last week. Hey, you know, you know what I love? What I love now, you know. So about a year ago it started. Like I would say something, people would say Malcolm didn't say do it that way, and I'd be like, <laughs> what? And it, it's like it's like people like. We have to agree on everything. I'm like, is this because we're? I don't understand. We're both fat and southern. I don't know, bro. But what I tell them is, is that there's a thousand ways to do everything in barbecue, and my way is not the only. I don't tell anyone that my way is the only way. And what I love about what you do, you don't tell anyone that your way is the only way. It's just how you do it. That's, that's how it works for me. That's exactly right. And it don't always work for me. But, <laughs> but you know, that's really. The thing you got to understand, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do this and ways, you know, to cook meat to, to where it's really, really good. I mean, you don't have to go the exact same route every time. Uh, and you get, even even once you reach that level of mastery, let's say I, I can cook ribs 10 out of 10 times, right? And they're, the neighbors love them. You get bored with it because now you've mastered it and then you want to change it up. So, dude, uh, you know, I, I'm going to toss you a question but before I do. Uh, guys, everyone that's joining us, if you got questions, Dude, this is the time to ask them. You're never going to get a better chance to ask Malcolm or I a question live and get both of our input, both of our feedback, unless you're going to show up at a barbecue competition and happen to catch both of us sitting down, which don't happen. Uh, so if you got questions, now's the time to ask them. But Malcolm, kind of leading into your recipes, talk about your process, dude, on you know how you come up with something. Is it just what you and Rochelle want to cook for the week or maybe you got an itch that you want to scratch? I mean, What's your process for coming up with all those recipes? Well, we try to keep a running list of ideas of things that we want to do for videos. And a lot of it's stuff that I've done before. Some of it's brand new stuff that I want to try. Um, we really don't have, um, I guess, a formula or method or anything. We uh, The only thing we try to stick to is we know around holidays, we're going to try to come out with something that's more appropriate for the holiday. But the rest of the time, I just, whatever I feel like doing. And so I'm a cookbook junkie and a recipe junkie. So I'm, yeah, me too. And I'm always looking at any, I've got, I've got a strong cookbook collection. Me uh, too. And I, I'm always going through them, looking for ideas. And I kind of keep a little running notepad in my phone. And if I see something that's cool, I might say, oh, man, this will go, you know, th this protein will work with this sauce. 
There you, there you go. Amazon just delivered this one today. <laughs> I have seen that one. That may have to be next on my list. But Dude, what I love about that one, you take any ingredient. You say beef, you say black pepper, you say asparagus. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, and it gives you – it's like an encyclopedia. It's, it's kind of like a thesaurus where it gives you everything that plays well in that flavor profile together. And that is gold. I was turned on to it by Sean Vaden. Um, I've looked at it a couple times, but never took it serious. But man, you gotta you gotta step your game up sometimes. Yeah, man, I gotta check that out. That's really interesting. That is a good one. I'm gonna throw one on the screen here, Malcolm. Uh, Travis Stein's asking if you go to the butcher and you want Dino beef ribs, how do you ask for them? You know, they're known by about 15 names, man. Well, the way I finally got my butcher to find them was. I asked for short ribs before they cut them because I went and made sure they had short ribs in the meat case. And just about every grocery store is going to have short ribs. Right. You can tell by it because it's, it's, it'll be in a little small package. And what they're doing, they're cross sections of those dino bones. Usually they're three or four right. inches long. And what they, they come in, they're actually chuck plate ribs. That's right. what it's called. Or there's also like a, I think it's the NAMLA number one two three eight is what they're known as, but butchers don't know that. Wait, this dude just broke out the encyclopedia of what you lost to Shane. All right, here we there go. We go. Come back. <laughs> All right, I got too excited. Yeah. All right, so yeah, you know when you can break out and tell people the NAMLA number of what the heck the older dude you've ordered a few beef ribs in your time. <laughs> But, you know, they, but I'm telling you, butchers don't have any clue what that means. And I only right. learned from the beef council guys. They were they just happened to be at a conference I was at, and I had that same question. How can I find these ribs? Because they don't know what dino bone ribs are. If you ask for beef ribs, they're going to give you just the, 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 the loin ribs actually off a cow, and those have had the ribeye cut off of them, so there's no meat on them. Right. And, yeah, they're wasted. And so it took me a while to figure it out. One day I was in Kroger, and I just saw them, and I asked the guy, and when he said, man, you don't want those, you know, what are you going to do with them? And I said, bring them out let me see them. And when he brought them out, it was this three-bone rack of these yeah. huge yeah. dino bone ribs. And I was like, jackpot, you know. <laughs> You're like, no, I do <laughs> want those. Like, don't take a knife to them. <laughs> yeah, he's like, they're 30-something dollars, you know, for the, I got to sell them to you the whole thing. And I said, yeah. that's what I want, yeah. yeah. And they're hard to get down our way, man. I've, I've paid a mint for them before, and but when you want them, you want them, man. Ray Hopkins asking, uh, do you have a video for smoking a stuffed pork one? Uh, there's actually one on the Gorilla Grill site, Ray, uh, that I put, uh, I mean, it's got a little bit of everything in it. Just go go look in the pork section there. There's a great one. Malcolm, I know you've probably done a couple of them as well. Yeah, I've got some on the How Barbecue Right. Uh, you can just search on it. I know I have one where I stuffed a smoked sausage inside of one. That was nice. really good. <clears throat> Oh, here, here's here's a question I get all the time, dude. What uh, what's the beverage of choice while smoking or cooking? I mean, it's what do you got? I mean, I, I drink probably more water than people know. I mean, I'm not everyone expects you to say bourbon or whatever, but Malcolm's been known to have a little little green drink and a few things, a little purple drink. Yeah, uh, man, I usually try if I'm going alcoholic, I try to stick with beer, but then I'm a bourbon man too. So, um, my personal just Regular bourbon, that's my drink of choice, is probably Woodford. I know it's not the most expensive out there, but it's good bourbon, but I'll still drink Jack Black. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if I go bourbon, it's got, I'm a Bland, uh, Blanton's fan. I just always have been ever since I got turned on to it. Um, nothing wrong with Woodford, though. Good stuff. Good stuff. I like Blanton's. It's just a little rich for my blood all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, we just came back from Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro, two years ago, I showed up and found out I needed – uh, turn-ins. Like, I didn't have any of the meat. Like, there was a huge miscommunication. I was coming to help with uh, some turn-ins. They're like, well, you don't have ribs? You don't have butts? And uh, thank heavens, freaking uh, Mark uh, Lambert was there, and he carries that that giant grizzly cooler, and he's always got a ton of Compart Duroc meat in there. And I was like, Mark, you gotta help me out. And he uh, he had a couple butts, had a bunch of ribs. I was like, what do I owe you? He's like, man, nothing. Just, just get, get, give me a drink someday. And there's that little liquor store down on the corner as you come into town, almost across from the Hardee's. And I went in there, and I'm a Blanton's guy. So I'm like, that was cool that he did that. I got to buy him at least some some nice bourbon. So I had to get the kid to climb up like four shelves up to find the one bottle of Blanton's in there and like knock the dust off of it and sell it to me. (laughs) And that's what I gave him for that meat. It was pretty funny. 
That's a good trade. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good trade. I mean, I know he was sponsored that beat, but it was cool that he helped us out. So, you know, you got you to help a brother, you know, hook a brother up when he does that. So um, this is a good one, Malcolm. I get this question a lot. When you're cooking briskets, and I'm going to assume this to mean at home, do you separate the uh, the point and the flat? At home, I don't. I kind of – I like them that Texas style, man, with a good hard bark on them. And yeah. I've, been, I've been doing them. I've, now, what I'll do, I will trim – fat down to about a quarter inch and i try mm -hmm. to get it to where the brisket lay flat and so you just kind of trim most of that down take the hump out you know where the deckle part is just square it up real good make it nice mm -hmm. and flat to where it's going to lay and you're going to get good even slices and then i just man a good salt and pepper rub don't need that's much awesome. not, not that i plug the gorilla beef rub there but that's a good place for it uh it, it was definitely built for brisket but to your point on the trimming of that i think if you're not going to separate the point in the flat, you've got to trim it. You've got to get that hard uh, fat out of it. And, and the, the key word you said is getting it flat as possible. You're trimming all that extra fat between the point and the flat so it lays as flat as possible. That cuts down your cook time. That ensures typically that it's not going to be as dry because, man, you're cooking a lot of mass that you're not going to eat when you cook all that fat. So you've got to trim it up if you're not going to separate it. Yeah, we. I mean, that's how I do it. And I like it because I can slice the point at that end too. I do I'm, the, I'm a fatty brisket guy. Me I like. Yeah, you know, I, I usually skip the lean and I go for the fatty brisket. The best pieces are right in there where you get a little flat and a lot of point too. Yeah, where they're they're right there laying on top of each other. You got that little ribbon of fat in between them. That that's my favorite part as well. That's my favorite part. And that's the part people don't go for. And I'm like, man, y'all don't know what you're missing. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Uh, we get asked this every time we do a live, Kenneth, when are we coming out with a portable tailgating grill? Uh, I, the, the only right answer to that is, uh, when, when Mark Graham says we're ready, uh, <laughs> and there's no in between on that. Uh, you know, I can't confirm nor deny anything. Uh, once we have one that we are certain is better than everything else you can get on the market, that's when grill will have one. That's the way we do everything. So just, just simple as that. They're talking about a brisket guy, the, the the brisket man, Eddie Hanks, man. That's a that's a great shout out, man. So uh, th this is a good question, man. H how did you get pulled into uh, to the smoking? I know the story, but maybe not everyone else knows the story of how you got into all this. Man, we just Memphis and May was always the big contest around where we live. Right up, in, we're right up in North Min uh, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, and every little town's got a contest. And so it was just something fun to do. I mean, it was, we had a bunch of my buddies, my brother, a bunch of my buddies. We, we decided to go to a barbecue contest, and it was more for fun, for partying back then. And we had such a good time doing it and there for a long time. We were just backyard amateur guys mm -hmm. uh, going and hanging out. We didn't really care how we finished. And then, But, I mean, over the years, you grow up, and we started winning a little bit, right. got a little more serious. And yeah, it's just, got a taste of that, 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 that money. <laughs> yeah, got a taste of the money. The trophies. I don't know yeah. if we have any money. We didn't ever make – we still don't make any money. Contest. No, it's just every time you make some good money, you go do, do something stupid like buy a new cooker or a new trailer. Oh, yeah. Believe me, I know. I'm picking up a Jambo here uh, next week. Wow. So you're, you're one of the few that got on the list, man. I know a lot of people have uh, started ordering Outlaws because yeah. it's, it's so hard to get, get a Jambo right now. I, I put my money down back in February, and it was nine months, so – Dang. It's, it's going, it's supposed to be painted right now. And I'm going, when I go to the SCA to pick, to, to cook the world championship steak uh, cook off, I'm going to pick it up and bring it back. So I'm that's excited awesome. because uh, that's one thing that I've never really cooked on a stick bar. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole new, it's a whole new pit for me to learn a new yeah. style of cooking. And, you know, it keeps me interested in it. And it's going to be a that's lot of fun doing some videos on a stick burner. I uh, I cooked uh, on a little. I w I didn't really cook on it, but I was around it enough that outlaw this weekend uh, at Murfreesboro, the barbecue bus team had. I was pretty impressed with it, man. I ain't gonna lie. It made me wanna made me wanna buy one. Except divorce is looming in my future if I do. So I had to had to maybe put a put a little halt on that for right now. But uh, that was the first time I've seen those pits, and man, they they look awesome. They're real good. There's a lot of cues borrowed from uh, from, from from Jambo. Let, let's be fair, but uh, it is what it is. You know, that, the whole flattery is the best form of a uh, you know whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
So, uh, you know, uh, Eddie, you, most of these guys know my background, how I got sucked into barbecue, man. I grew up around it. My grandfather had a barbecue restaurant. I did my best to run away from it and got sucked right back into it, man. Joined the military, joined the Navy at, what, five? I spent my first Sunday in boot camp. It was my 18th birthday in the Navy. <laughs> um, just to get away and look, man, I came right back, man. You can't get away from it, so... Hey, speaking of good cook we had together, Malcolm, those uh, those tacos, man, the street tacos. Get a little love from John on those, man. Hey, those were awesome, man. I still talk about those. And you know that, that I, I, I just – they just started selling the, the Gochi Chang in, in the, our grocery store, <clears throat> our Kroger here locally. Yep. I was like, man, first time I've ever seen it. Well, it, it, so that's what I do love. We're in an age where – a lot of these very cultural ingredients are now becoming very commonplace. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, there's a long time, like, you know, the stuff from Japan. I mean, if I didn't order it, you know, and wait two weeks, I, I you know, I, I would get in it. So it's really cool to see the Indian influences, the Asian influences all coming, you know, to, to middle of nowhere America on the store shelves. I love it. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna have to try it in the pulled pork. I haven't done that yet, dude. It's good. It it is real good. The only thing I will say this: it's a very dark kind of flavor, and uh, you cut that with some vinegar sauce. That's that's money right there. So I've got a couple of pork bellies in the freezer. That I'm gonna be doing some stuff with. So I may try some Asian Asian style kind of pork belly and play and use some some of those ingredients in it. I, I think it'll be really good. Yeah, dude, anywhere you put that stuff makes sense, man. He, I, I love funky ingredients like that, so you can't uh, can't can't beat that. Uh, this is a good one from Ryan, that, but the problem is we could talk on this for, for, for hours, but what's your favorite non-traditional twist on classics, like, you know, different ways to do pulled pork brisket ribs, et cetera? Um, you know, I'll, I, to speak out of turn, I'm sure, Malcolm, you probably agree, I hate competition barbecue. I hate eating it right now. So I do anything I can to take a non-traditional twist on typical barbecue ingredients. And that's exactly, you know, when I brought those street tacos down, you know, to cook with you, that's exactly the idea. We took ribs and made street tacos out of them. You know, that's, that's the whole point to, to just have something different and give a different, different look. I mean, one of my favorite ways is doing like the, tacos always come to mind. So we do a lot of Mexican food mm -hmm. and, Using pulled pork to make tacos and being able to put some of those, uh, you know, Mexican Spanish style influences in the meat, mm -hmm. not, you know, not trad traditional barbecue rub, they're awesome. But I, for me, non traditional is, is trying to just let the meat speak for itself a lot of times. I try well, to get away from using so much products on it and just that, cook the meat. There's an arc I feel that everyone goes through, right? Uh, you, you start to. You think mastery is just turning out a good product for a while, and then you cook it so much that you realize that was too easy, and then you get, totally shift the other way, and it's like, well, mastery is how can I make this the best it is with the least amount of ingredients? And that that's where I've gotten to. When I do a brisket at home, like if, if you guys saw it, you'd be so disappointed because you're like, man, you didn't inject that. You didn't do all this with it. No. I'm like Malcolm, salt, pepper, uh, or a lot of times it's just salt and gorilla beef rub. And that's all I'll put on it because I don't need a lot else. I want to taste that meat. I'm paying for good meat. I mean, especially when you throw down the Wagyu or one of these A9s from the butcher shop in Pensacola. Man, you want that meat to sing. I ain't getting in its way. That's right. I mean, exactly right. So, you know, Brian, to answer your question, what's one recipe that I've yet to master to my liking? Um, I don't do desserts at all. Um, I don't like baking because I can't, like, I can't free flow enough in there. Right. Cause like the measurements matter. So I'm terrible at baking. So if I had to pick one thing, anything sweet that requires me to bake something or actually have, well, good science behind it <laughs> other than just flavor. Mine's probably fish. And it seems like I have the most trouble trying to grill or, or do fish to my liking. And I've done, you know, I've done some great stuff, some that's really, really good. But then I've messed up probably more fish than than any other thing that I've tried, attempted to cook. 
I don't know what it is. It just can be difficult. Um, a lot of it probably do with, has to do with getting good fish, but you know, that's the tough part in landlocked states is getting high quality protein to work with. You know, when it comes to to seafood. <clears throat> but I feel as far as pork and beef, I, I pretty much got those. I wouldn't say I'm a master. I'm still learning, and I still learn every day when when I cook stuff. But uh, I, I feel like I've got a pretty good grip on. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. I, you know, my version of being a pit master is. I should be able to cook just about anything you throw at me with whatever ingredients you have and make something edible on anything. And I mean anything from a candle up to a jambo. Whatever you got, I should be able to create something. Uh, and, and that's why I keep striving and pushing, you know, this year for world food. I didn't go into the categories that I, I knew that I would crush it in. I, I went in sandwich because I don't even like sandwich as a category because I don't eat bread right now. But I wanted to force myself into growing and learning and you know, get out of my comfort zone and just keep that that evolution happening. I, I think that's where it's all at. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. That's what makes it inter- keeps it interesting too. You know? Yeah, do, I, I totally agree. You get so kind of mundane and doing the same thing over and over. You got to find different ways to make it interesting, make it challenging. I a thousand percent agree, dude. Otherwise, you're going to burn out. Quick, uh, Kenneth, to answer your question real quick, uh, because this is the Grill of Grill show, uh, not just the Malcolm and Shane show where we <laughs> we just goof off and talk about what we like to eat. Uh, the best seller is probably still the Silverback, followed very closely by the original Gorilla, um, and then the Kong after that. Uh, I think that's because the Silverback is a much more relatable platform. It's a size, it's in a shape that most people can relate to. But uh, man, don't sleep on that Gorilla. Because it a whole more food than you think, and its shape does an amazing job on food. So the reality is I would recommend picking whichever one fits your family and lifestyle best. If you need the room, go silverback. Uh, if you don't need the room or you need to save space, go gorilla, hands down. Let me uh, scroll up here, see if I can find some. Uh... <laughs> we'll throw this one up there. This is a good one for you, Malcolm. Uh I'll, uh, what, what grills do you use? And, uh, this is, the, I'll let you go through your process of, you won't sign a contract with the company. And that's one of the reasons I like working with you, but talk about that a little bit. And then some of your, your favorite grills in different styles. Cause you're like me, you've got one, five in every style. Yeah. Well, my big, my thing's always been that I, I want to learn to cook on all different kinds of grills. So I feel like just, you know, speaking out for one particular one kind of pigeonholes myself. And, you know, people that are out there that watch my videos and follow me and stuff uh, know that they might not have the same grill that I have, but that they can cook on whatever they have. So I try to mix it up and make it interesting. Now, I do have a couple that I say, are my, when everybody asks me if I had to pick one of my smokers, what would I pick? I'm always going to say my old hickory. Because it's, I mean, it's my money maker. It's it's the one that makes me. I mean, it cooks a lot of a lot of food. You know, it's got plenty of room on it. Um, you know, it's great for comps. It's great for cage small catering jobs. Uh, it's 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 great for cooking at home. I mean, um, but not everybody's going to go out and buy an old hickory either. Uh, if I had to pick one small grill, man, I'm probably going to go with my drum. And that's what I have on my comp trailer is an old hickory ACMM, which is the same yeah. as a CTO without gas. And I have a big pop of kit drum. It's mm-hmm. it's raggedy, it's beat up, it's rusty, but it still cooks some fine barbecue. And it's just it's, it's simple to operate. So, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. Uh, if I had to pick, I, I'm the same way. I'm, a, I'm still a big old Hickory fan. I I you know I spent the ten thousand dollars and bought old Hickory CTO double wide. Uh, I've owned three regular CTOs in my time in barbecue. I probably if we if I got to cook anything over about four butts, I'm cooking on that every time because it's so repeatable, it's so good, it's so easy. Um, I still love my old Tucker cooker. If you guys don't haven't seen a Tucker cooker, uh, it's before all the fireboxes got insulated, but it's an offset. It's also a really cool grill. Um, but you know, listen, there's a reason why I do work with Gorilla. I for the ease and simplicity of of being able to slap that easy button. And making you a star in your backyard with a basic recipe, man, Gorilla's doing it right. I got to give them props on that. And there's a lot of companies doing it right, but, you know, they're pretty expensive. So I, I'm proud of what Gorilla's done, price point versus what you're getting delivered to your door. 
Well, I think for ease of use, you can't go wrong with one of the pellet grills. I mean, the grill them. I mean, like you said, for the value for your money, ship right to you. That's the best deal going. But I, I like my pellet grills too. I've got three pellet grills. <laughs> well, actually, I've got four. One of them's at Deer Camp. So, <laughs> and I've got three out here on my on my you know my little cooking area, and I use them all. I use them all. I mean, they're they're a uh, they're great. They're great pits. I, I mean, I catch it. Now I catch my fair share of flack too by you know cook, people saying pellet, pellet grills aren't you know you're not a genuine pit master if you're smoking right. with pellet and all that. But but I say if you can make it taste good, it don't matter what you're cooking on. Hey, I've had my butt cooked kicked by drums by WSMs by jambos. I mean, at the end of the day, man, it's all on you, the pit master. It's not the pit. So yeah. if you can win, you know on on a tin can, then good on you, man. Good on That's you. That's what I say, too. And, then, you know, I recommend everybody start out just a regular regular Weber. If mm-hmm. you can learn to cook on a Weber grill, you can cook on anything. And I, I agree with I, that. I started out cooking Once on you learn anything. fire management, the world opens up for you. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Malcolm, this is a good one. I know you've done chuck roast a thousand different ways. I have, too. Uh, but, uh, what, what's one of your favorite ways to do it, man? Man, Sunday roast is probably my, one of my favorite meals. And when you put it on the smoker, it's it's even better. I, I mean, I, I treat it just like I don't like I do a brisket, except I add vegetables and and all that. We, they started out the roast, season it up instead of browning it like you would in an iron skillet for throwing in the crock pot. I just throw it on the smoker, let it get some color on the outside, let it bark up, and then it goes in a pan. And that's where the beef broth comes in: the uh, onions, uh, celery, carrots, potatoes. All that good stuff. I mean, I'll even put a package of beef stew season in there sometimes. Oh, dude, the old, the old lifted onion soup mix. You can't. Yeah. Dude, the old crock pot days. My 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 mom and grandma. Man, you got to put the lifted onion soup mix up in there. I'm telling you, it makes it, it. It'll turn your. I got a recipe for it. I call it not your grandma's pot roast. I think or whatever. Mm-hmm. But that's what it is. It's pot roast on a smoker. Yeah, and, and I tell you that smoke hard. when you do it on there, and then you pull that stuff off and you put it back in your gravy. Man, the gravy and everything so has a, that extra smoke. I, I love it. Yeah. It all it, it picks up that flavor. Hey, and man, in fact, we we have we have pot roast all the time. We do it on the smoker. Yeah, it, down here in the south, man, every Sunday's pot roast day. That's how, especially in the winter, you're gonna have roast potatoes and carrots, baby. You know, it's going question is, is it beef pot roast or is it pork pot roast? But you're gonna have some sort of pot roast every Sunday with Your roast potatoes out. and carrots. Put it on before church and come home that afternoon. It's ready to roll. That's right. That's right. We either, either serve it with mashed potatoes or rice. Sometimes both. Both. <laughs> whatever you need. Starts <laughs> it up. <laughs> this is a good one from Mike Ross. Actually, uh, Mike came up, uh, and you you may not remember, but he introduced himself at, at Murfreesboro, older gentleman. Uh, Mike, to your point, it is rewarding that people cook our recipes. Um I will say it's sometimes frustrating because I can't – for every attaboy – I've also gotten a pit master, my bleep, you know, <laughs> what were you doing on this one? So it, it ebbs and it flows. I mean, not everything is a winner. And just because I love it, don't mean everyone will, but I didn't ask them to cook it. I just put it out there. <laughs> if you want to cook it, you can. I just like spreading the word, man. And if, if it helps one person cook better, it's rewarding enough for me to do it. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing this for rewards or anything. But, it, I mean, yeah, of course, you know, it feels good to, to somebody to say, man, I tried your recipe and it turned out great. Right. And that's what lots of them look. Did you put your spin on it? What would you do? Right. No, I do the same thing. I, I will say my favorite time for that is usually around Thanksgiving. Uh, and one of my favorite stories is uh, a gentleman ordered a Kong. It was delivered. He literally got it put together and left for uh, duck hunting. And he left his wife with the uber picky mother-in-law at the house and says, Hey, I want you to do the Turkey grilled this time. And she sent in an email was frantic. She's like, I can't even like this thing. I don't even know how to do anything with it. And, uh, we sent her a link to one of the, uh, the Turkey videos that we did on the Kong and dude, she wrote back day after Thanksgiving and said, you know, she crushed it. I mean, at, you know, out of the park, even great, you know, crazy, uh, you know, grandma or you know, mother-in-law, Loved it, you know, and those stories you don't forget, and that, that's always cool when that happens. So. It is. That, that's. I mean, I love hearing th- those kind of stories, or one where somebody's done something else, and it's 
it just sounds so amazing that they use that for inspiration and they turned it into something they created, you know? And I've even tried some of the ones people tell me like, man, I did this to it. You should try it sometimes. And it's been better than what I did. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And that's part of that evolution of what this is. And it's what I love. You know, when I, when I was, you know, putting together the book that I was going to write, you know, I went to how to barbecue, right. And I looked like, well, what all is Malcolm cook? Well, you know, well, what if I took what he did on that pot roast and put it with these beef ribs and then put a French spin on it? What does that look like? You know, and starting to piece all this stuff together and, yeah, it's borrowing, you know, of whatever. It's inspiration. It's the same thing. But it's all about what just getting that fire lit, man, and, and just getting fired up about cooking something, getting excited about it. So, Kenneth, your, your question here, uh, you know, about tomahawk ribeyes. Man, I'll be honest with you. I'm not the biggest fan of tomahawk ribeyes. I think you pay a heck of a lot of money for a heck of a lot of stuff you're not eating. Just give me a good old thick legit ribeye that bone man my dog's eating that i i can't eat it so that you know i i don't i don't buy them that much malcolm where, where would you get one online uh, you know they're cool it is a it is kind of a waste to pay for that bone but um i i, I did a few i've been working with matador prime meats and they had some really good meat uh, i would probably imagine creekstone has them but i tell you where i've seen them in stores is sam's club Sam's Club's kind of stepped their game up with their little meat department. At least they have in, in our area. Well, I'll say they're trying to keep up with Costco now. Costco was handing them their lunch in the meat department for a while, man. Yeah, I, and I go to Costco, too. They Both of those places are usually my, my go-to, you know, if I'm looking for something special like that and I can't find it or I can't get a butcher to get it. The only mm-hmm. thing bad about ordering online, man, you pay so much for shipping. It wears your mother, man. And, you know, we we did the, you know, SRF and ordering our, you know, competition briskets, man. But, man, unless you're ordering about four at a time, shipping is such a killer. And even when they're like, oh, here's your free shipping code, bro, you're still paying for shipping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Hey, man, Kevin, I guarantee you, Kevin down there at the butcher shop in Pensacola probably gets gets those tomahawks, too. Oh, yeah. that's a, that's a And he will hand select one for you, hand cut it for you. Um, you know, I just got two briskets in for him and I'll say this, those a nines were beautiful. And even though I paid for shipping through him, it ended up being about 40 bucks less than where I normally order my briskets, even with their free shipping. So Kevin's got a good business, the butcher shop in Pensacola. You want the East Pensacola location, call him up, talk to him. He'll, he'll, he'll take care of you for, you know, can't argue that. Look at that. Ben, I just show up and win Wilson in the house. Man. Yeah. How, how many times has Ben showed up to a contest and ruined your day, man? Because he's, he's messed up my day plenty. Ben is a heck of a cook, man. I tell you what, we we chase him all the time. I Dude, I, I love it, man. He, I, I'm, I'm thankful to get to cook with him. I've, I'm shigging like crazy up in there. But, <laughs> and he's, it, it, I'm fortunate he's a teammate, but uh, man, it's He's a heck of a cook. He, he's got it dialed in. I, I love it. Here's a good one, Malcolm. So uh, if you're taking money out of your pocket, whose products are you going to represent, man? Well, let's see. All time, if I had to go, man, it's hard. I mean, so everybody knows that the Simran Dock Sweet Rib Rub, I mean, that's one that's Cinnamon a classic. Docks. And the Smoking Guns Hot. I mean, those yeah. are two classics, man. I don't buy them anymore because there's so, you know so much other good stuff out there, but it's hard for me not to just use salt, pepper, and garlic, which is the base of my AP. I give that right? recipe out. I don't know why anybody buys it because I give the recipe out. <laughs> well, it's got your name on it, man. You know, it, it was it was touched by greatness. <laughs> hey, I, I will say if I had to plug a couple, um, co- pretty much every one of Daring uh, Cosmos products are solid, man. Everything from the dust, the wing dust, down to his injections, all across the rub line, solid stuff. Same thing for Heath Riles, great stuff. Um, man, who's another one I would pick out of the out of the air without? I mean, dude, I still hey competition fact. I mix Gorilla stuff with Malcolm's rub all the time. Why? Because I like the punch my rub has. I like the colors that, that you got, man. Uh, most of us guys are blending three and four rubs together when, when we're out competing. That's true. That's true. I was trying to think just some old time ones that I've been using for years. Um, 
What's the uh, Plowboys? That was one of the first ones I used oh, on. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yardbird, maybe? Yardbird. Uh, I was trying to think of the cow. Was it Cow Cover or something? Yeah. Yeah. Those are some, those are some of the old school ones that, that are, I don't know, I guess they're still around. I don't really know. They uh, kind of, they lost a little yeah. bit of popularity, um, but they, they're still out there. Yeah. I tell you, Big Papa's got some good rubs. If you've never tried his stuff, man. man I it's... almost plugged Big Papa. Um, I don't love everything he's got, but I'll tell you this: the stuff that I do like of his, I really like. Like it's like a, it's weird for me. It's like a big hit or a big miss of me for his stuff, and I don't know why that is. I haven't figured it out. Um, uh, Meat Sweet Church, Sweet Meat Rubble Church, Mine. a great company. Yeah, uh, Mark Lambert Sweet Rubble Mine. That's a classic. I mean, I can beat that. Dude, his that. vinegar sauce and your vinegar sauce, two of the best on the yeah. market. At least I still I still get marks from him. I mean that's it's it's a it's just a great pork rub. Yeah, I agree. Hey, uh, there there we go. <laughs> Everybody, I get asked this question a lot too. What what gloves are you using? I know you aren't just using nitro gloves, man. Your hands get tough. I'm gonna tell you now. <laughs> hey, that's a, that's a that's my, that's my buddy Marshall. I went to high school with him. What's up? That's Mar- awesome. I hadn't seen him in years. <laughs> No, those are just. I use white cotton glove liners underneath them. You mm-hmm. can, pick, I mean, you can pick them up at like um, Harbor Freight or um, I would imagine any hardware store where they sell like work gloves. Usually sells a glove liner, but it's just a white cotton string knit glove, and you yeah. put the nitro glove right over it. And now you're not going to go grabbing, you know, hot coals or grabbing the fire basket or anything like that. But you can pull a rack out and you can handle hot meat. It really, I call them hand savers. I sell them on my website because they save your hands. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and you know, that's that's the thing. What I love, well, you and I had a, a pre-broadcast discussion. You and Rochelle have expanded a lot of what is, is on your site. It's not just a place to get the killer hog stuff, man. You've got a good selection of just about everything there, you know, so go hit that site up. If you want to pay shipping one time, go hit his site up, man, and order that stuff. We try to. I, I try to carry stuff that I use all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. Hey, we'll, we'll throw this one out there because it's completely uncooking related. Uh, for me, Paul, because I got cheap, dude. I moved everything and handgun over nine millimeter. It's not that I don't like forty five; just that I'm cheap. I've got a forty caliber. Yep, nine forty. Whatever, it's all good, man. So. Uh, Here's a good one to debate, man, and this is a really good one. This is what I love about Meathead because Meathead, I don't always agree with where he gets to, but I can always respect how he got there. Um, But he does say using, in the science of the smoke ring, using regular charcoal over lump gives you a better smoke ring. And you know what? He's right. I've proven that. Uh, That dirty smoke from that briquette actually, in my opinion, produces a better smoke ring. And I can tell you how you can prove it. Go burn nothing but lump on a Kamado. You'll lose that smoke ring and you got to use a product like wood chips or mojo bricks or something to help get it back. And that's how you can, you can prove that. That is probably right. What what do you think Mal? Well, yeah, it's, it's right. I mean, I don't get, and I've got, I use lump on a, a drum smoker and I still get a good smoke ring. I think it has more to do with the way oxygen and air flows moving through the cooker to get the, I mean, when in the Kamado style pits, you have them choked down so low most of the time. They're really not burning. Yeah. You're not getting good burning. So you're not using as much of it to get that reaction to happen. Um, mm-hmm. Now, what I found more of the smoke ring has to do more with the seasonings you put on it and, what, and how long you leave them on there. Or because, putting too much seasoning on there, blocking some of the smoke ring. I see people it, layer it so thick, man. There's no way a smoke ring is going to happen on that. That's exactly right. It's, I mean, to me, getting some salt on there first is really part of the key Crucial. part. Crucial. It's a key part of making that reaction. Because what it is, reaction in the meat causing that. It's not just smoke right. that's right. dying meat or anything. It's a chemical reaction that's changing uh, those proteins in the meat to have that color. Right. You can exactly falsely right. And, and why does salt do it? Well, salt's like dry rot. You're, you're drawing more of that moisture up to the surface with the salt. And then you can trap it, you know, that chemical reaction, the moisture on top because of that salt, it has more of an opportunity to happen because you pre-salted it, drew the moisture up, et cetera, et cetera. So 
And I get I get a lot of questions about how come they're not getting smoke rings on uh, Kamado style pits, and it's always an airflow issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay, people, so, so 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 we're 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 back, right? <laughs> yeah. So we might have lost everybody. They may have gave up on us, but that's all well, right. Well, that's okay. We'll finish it with uh, with one of the questions I had. Uh, and then we'll piece it all together uh, in post. Did a show that we're going live here pretty quick. People should jump right back in if, if they're available. Uh, we really only got 15 minutes left anyway. But, yeah, so it was crazy. I could hear you. I could see you. Uh, you couldn't see or hear me. But yeah. I'm pretty sure I was still broadcasting. So, okay. <laughs> so either way, um, hey, man, one thing, you know, we, we touched on books earlier. But what's, a, what's one book? And it don't have to be barbecue related, man. What's a book that you've – shared or recommended or wish that more people like would read what's a what's a good one man i'm gonna say the one that i've probably recommended the most has been the it's paul kirk's championship rubs and sauces it's a little bitty book that's got if, if you know i get a lot of questions about how i came up with the rubs and how i came up right. with the sauces that we have and all that or how does you know just how to start and i always reference that little book and you probably have it i mean it's yeah it's around for ages but um one of my personal favorites just that i enjoyed reading was mike namey mills first book yeah that was uh, a good one yeah uh, i forget the name of it now it's probably over here on my shelf but <laughs> yeah we had peace love and barbecue and they, they had a bunch of them man but uh, yeah peace love and barbecue that was one um the, the reason why we got a brief mention in that and that was early in our career when we were cooking backyard we were up in galax virginia the first time um, I'd ever been there and, and Rick Dalton had needed some help and, uh, and needed some help getting a hog on because it was just him and one other guy that were there and me and Waylon just happened to be there. And, you know, we, he kind of let us hang out and see them do their hog. That was when Guatney was running and won Memphis in May that year and all that. Oh so, yeah. So we, and the guy that was writing that book was there, you know, hanging out with them. And so he just briefly said something about and killer hogs help load the hog. That's all it was. <laughs> And I was like, we made a book, Waylon. <laughs> so oh, was, yeah. That, dude, you, you, you barbecue famous out of the gate, man. <laughs> That's, That's all it takes right there. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I threw a link in there, guys, for that Paul Kirk book. It's a good book. Um, I think one of the first books I got was Ray Lampy's like, Championship Barbecue or whatever. And, I mean, it was, it was okay, especially if I didn't know anything. But, Dude, there's so much available on YouTube now. Like you, people like you and me, just giving it away, man. We ain't ever going to get a chance to write a book. That's right, I, man. I've been working on. Me and Rochelle have been working on a book for three years. Yeah. And it seems like we always push it. Oh, uh, you know, this off season we call it off season or winter months. Right. <laughs> but the off season, yeah, we're, we're going to jump right back in our book and we're going to do this and that, and and time just flies. And we always, you know, we've been so busy trying to put out fresh content and. Now trying to do the podcast and all this, so it's just our book keeps getting pushed to the back burner. That's but I've got so many recipes; I need to do something with them. Well, and that's what I got down to as well. And and the thing is, the book I want to write isn't a cookbook per se. It's really some stories about barbecue that end in a recipe. You know what I mean? Tell a story about some stuff my grandfather and I used to do, and then here's the recipe. You know, or or whatever. So it's. It's tough to get publishers to buy in on that when they're like, I don't know you and you're not yeah. famous. <laughs> well, so that's what I'm, I'm waiting to get famous one day. Maybe they'll come looking for me to write a book. But. I, I keep thinking that. I'm gonna win, that's, my, that's my plan. That's my retired plan, Malcolm. I'm going to win Memphis in May and write a book, and we're on easy street because well, all it. people write books are making a lot of money. No, it seems not. like you got to have a book. I don't know why. <laughs> it seems to be the thing, dude. I know some not famous people who have wrote really not good books. So. Yeah. You know, I figure if they can do it, I can do it too. So this is a good one from Tom Hyland, uh, the the old fat cap up or down man. Uh, and I'll, I'll let you throw your, uh, your 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 thoughts in on that first. Well, I always say that it goes to, depending on whichever way your heat source is. I usually orient the fat. Um, Correct answer. <laughs> that was, oh, it, it's not because it bases the meat; it's to protect it a little more. I mean, that's right. All it's Especially if you're hot and fast in that meat, use that fat cap as an insulator. Yeah, you know. But on pellet grills, man, they circulate enough air now that it almost doesn't matter. But if you find on the bottom of your grate, uh, because of how that shield is, if it's direct heat and go fat down, 
But if you're cooking 250, 275, it's not getting that hot. And you can totally, it don't matter. Up and down, I've tried it both ways. I had an interesting question this weekend, and the guy, he was he was cooking on another pellet grill. I'm not going to name any names. wasn't Gorilla. <laughs> but he, he said, he you know, he did the ribs, and he put some of my vinegar sauce in there. He wrapped them up, and he put them back on. He'd been cooking them like 225, and then it just burned up on him. And and he was like, he, he, he wanted to know if my sauce had something wrong with it that it caused his ribs to burn up. And I was like, no, I've never seen, you know, a sauce burn like that. The only thing that it could have been was how long did you leave the lid open when you were wrapping those ribs? Because he had yeah. the lid up and it let, you know, just, and it, you know what it does, the auger oh, just yeah. dropping, dropping, dropping. Well, and we had a very rainy, cold, kind of a weird weather going on there. I could totally see that temp probe going, holy crap, we better, we better throw some coal to it, man, and it, and it take off, you know? And that's exactly what happened to him. It kind of burnt the bottom of him, but hmm. but yeah, it, it, you know you got to think about that when you're wrapping too, which is why you have your meat oriented on a grill. If your heat source is underneath it, you leave the lid off. That fire is going to get hotter than you know. Absolutely. It, no matter what kind of grill, if you're on a, a drum, is really bad about it. Leave your lid off, lid off a drum yep. for thirty seconds. I mean, it'll go in the same way. You feed that fire, you finally get it going. It's going to take off, man. So here's a good one: if you could cook with one other person to barbecue. Who would it be? Mine would be, it would be you, Malcolm. <laughs> We've cooked together. Yeah, a few times, man. You know, I don't know. That's a good question. I'd probably want to cook with uh, Darren Wars. <laughs> I, right? want <laughs> I, I want to shake the heck out of that. He's he's hot right now. I want to cook with him at the Jack. Yeah. He's my, he's my barbecue idol. I give him hell about it. Yeah. I always tag him in my, <laughs> my barbecue idol. You know, no. the, the, the thing is, it's not so much a who, but it, I'm like you, Malcolm. It's a it's a who and a where, right? Because I feel like I could probably cook with, you know, a Tuffy or a Malcolm or, or a, a Myron or one of those guys if I really wanted to and I really ask. But it's not that I just want to cook with them. It's where you want to cook. Like, you know, it was always like I want to cook with this guy at Memphis and May kind of thing. You know what yeah. I mean? Hey, word has it. Word has it that Mr. Mr. – Royal himself is going to do Memphis and May this year. I, I heard that a, a, around the yeah, campfire. He me, but he's doing it with some other people. I don't know if he's doing it under his name, but that's what that was. He's trying to test the water. And I told him, man, if I was him, I'd be concentrating on it. I would too, because uh, I mean, he's won everything else. You may as well try to get in there and win that one. That would now, be what he don't know is going to cost him about sixty thousand dollars and about five trips to get good, you know, to figure oh, out Memphis and May because it's only it's own is. screwed up thing. So. Uh, on your on that book, Malcolm, that the Paul Kirk's book, that, that, that's a beginner level book. I mean, oh uh, yeah, I- anyone can in, can take that and 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 get something from it, and, and even master level can talk because you know once you get to a certain level, I can look at a recipe for a rub and tell you whether it's going to be any good or not. Um, but I can always look at a recipe and get inspired by something that's in there. I'm like, oh, I wouldn't necessarily put that in there, but hey, maybe if you did it like this, you know, so you can always get something out of out of those recipes. I would say most of the barbecue books I have are beginner level. <laughs> There's not none of them that are technical. I agree. I'll tell you another one of my favorites, Adam Perry Lane's book. Do you have it? Do anything APL does. So here's what I love about him is that he's a barbecue guy, but he's not. That guy's a freaking yeah. legit chef, he and is. he brings it. The first time I, I read, like the first thing I really saw from him was when he introduced me to board sauces. I can't remember the book where he's like basically talking about all that stuff when you cut your meat, all that stuff that runs off, yeah. you make a sauce out of it. I was like, my <laughs> blown. Yeah, yeah. No, he's legit. His stuff, his stuff is top notch. But he yeah. does now. I wouldn't say it, it's more. It, it's it's chefy for barbecue, but it's still it not, a little chefy. It's not above. It's not above everybody because he explains it so well in the book. I agree. He makes it accessible, but it's some high end stuff, and I, I appreciate that. You know, I think you got to bring that to the table if you're a guy like him. So, Malcolm, you know, we're both going to say the same thing. Let's inject or don't inject. And when do you inject and blah, 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 blah. Um, dude, outside of competition, I don't inject anything ever, ever. Definitely not brisket. Mm-mm. Yeah. I may inject turkeys at Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, I will do them, um, but only because I'm lazy and I don't want to freaking mess up 19 coolers with Brian. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't inject pork at home either. Hey, I got the answer for this one, Malcolm, right here. I, I, I'm gonna let you rib them for a minute before I give it to him. 
<laughs> you have to be I'm Mark. Be in there. I have. I wake up every morning of SCA contest chanting, "Beat Mark Williams, beat Mark Williams." That's that's funny because uh, oh, what you both ought to be chanting is, "Man, I hope Emily don't kick my butt." <laughs> She's legit, yeah. man. I, as soon as I met her, I was like, "I love you." I was like, "You're awesome." <laughs> hey, Mark is killing on the grill. Him and Emily and Jamie, man, they are. They are doing it up on the Grilla Grills at these SCA events, and they're they're trying to beat. You know, Rectech's doing this push where they're having this thing, and mm -hmm. whoever can win on the contest. But I think Mark's gonna get them on the Grilla for any of those guys to get close. I think so too, because he they're just so consistent. He and Emily both, man. Uh, for guys that don't know, uh, we've got a couple. Now it's two. It was only Mark with Swine Life, but Emily's. You know, she's killing everybody. She's going to have her own grill for, for SCA down World Food. I think she's going to show some people up, man. I'm interested to see how, how they're going to do down there. I know we're, we're putting them in the steak trailer and hauling them out to uh, Fort Worth here next week. So Grilla will be at the state championship, hopefully come out, you know, in the top. Dude, I, I wish. I'm not going to lie, Shane. I want to beat them on my PK. But <laughs> uh, and that's all good. It's all good. Hey, we just want top five every time. I they're so consistent. I, I they're going to hit one of these times, man. I know it's going to happen. But uh, I, I can answer this one here. What, what, what's Malcolm's favorite thing to smoke? What do you got? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah, what do I not like? God, if I had to pick, it is hard to beat just a good salt and pepper brisket. It really is. Or a Memphis dry rib. Those are. Those are like if you got if you got that coming off a of pit, I'm always gonna say yeah, I'll try that. Right. You just, I, mean, I love a good crusty old school rib. You know, no sauce, got yeah. some crunch on the outside, but ooey gooey in the middle. Man, I will never say no to it. Like I could be full, hurting on the floor, and I'm still gonna eat another one. Oh yeah. Those. I do like a little vinegar sauce on the side to dab it in. I really do. That's I'm with you on that. I'm with that's you on how, that. To me, that's how ribs should should be ate. I'm telling you. I'm with you on that. I'm totally with you on that. <laughs> Dude, you, don't, don't answer it. That one's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, 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 If I had to guess your answer, I'm going to say oh, Old Hickory. Yeah. If I had one, if I could only pick one. I hadn't cooked on my jambo yet. So. <laughs> Let me I see think you're going to like that jambo, know. but, man, the easy button of that old hickory is tough to deny. Yeah. I'm not going to know because I know that – I know as long as I have that old hickory, I can make me money and get me whatever other pit I want. I mean, that's the honest truth. That's true. But old yeah. hickory is a money maker. Hey, and we're not talking about just competition. We're talking about catering, too. I oh, can't yeah. count oh, the okay. number of thousands of pounds of meat I have put through our old hickories. Selling a sandwich at a time, six vending. six bucks a whack, man. We do vending, we do uh, fundraiser cooking, mm -hmm. you know, we do some catering. I mean, the and you know, now I'm not, I've never cooked on a Southern Pride, but they're just like an old hickory. I just right. happen, I just happen to be a <laughs> old hickory man. So, I you know, I got sucked into it because they're 45 minutes from my house, um, you know, Cape Dorado area, so. It just made sense for us. To, if I'm going to spend that much money, I want someone real close to my house to come fix it. <laughs> if it's not working. Dan Knight, man, he's a heck of a guy, and they got a great operation. I've got to be buddies with all those people up there at the Cape. Yeah. And, and they are solid. I mean, if you ever have a problem, you can talk to them, and they will they get it fixed. And, and you can work on those old hickories. There's not a part that you can't run to the store and get it to fix it. That, that's what I really like, and really they're, they're low maintenance. I mean, other than the fans and stuff like that, I mean – you can't hardly break them. Yep. So it, it's a good one from uh, from Tom, man. And, and and I won't keep you too much more, man. I told you it's gonna be about an hour. We're we're, we're right at it. Um, but uh, you know, if, if you guys have any parting questions, if we see a real good one, we'll we'll throw it out there. Just kind of a parting shot. Uh, Nathan, I know you ask, uh, how do you uh, how do you do beef ribs, man? Jump on our sites, man. Go to Gorilla's site. Go to Malcolm's site. How to barbecue right .com. You know, and and hit that search because all the answers are there. You know, everything you need to know is right there. So, all right, man. Any, any parting parting comments, Malcolm? Man, I just appreciate you inviting me on, man. It's been a blast. I love. I can sit here and talk barbecue all night. <laughs> well, I, I, I could too. I'm getting the evil eye. My wife's giving me yeah. the. Uh, I sent them out to dinner, but uh, you know, she she give me the evil eye. It's time to wrap it. Joke. <laughs> 
So we can do still, it. Or, 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 or hands down, two of my favorite people. Uh, you know, I leave I leave Waylon out all the time. But a lot of people don't know that that Killer Hog is a family affair, man. You got your brother, you got your wife, you got everybody involved, and, and I love it. Uh, you know, Mark and Emily, we talk about them. They're kind of extended family for you guys, and it all come up out of just love for cooking. And you guys, you know, you started just like I did, started as nothing, and just kept at it, man. And it just keeps growing. So I, I love to see your success, man. I appreciate it, Shane. And hey, let's get together down at World Foods. Maybe we can jump on another another live stream or something. So I'll let the cat out of the bag. I plan on live streaming every day that week of World Food, kind of a behind the scene. Um, I don't know if they're going to let me live stream off my camera while I'm competing, but I am going to hide a GoPro like on the corner of my table because I want to I want to record my cook. I want to see what what I did wrong, what I did right. Um, but man. We're, we'll, we're going to get together a few times down there for some uh, some purple drink and uh, <laughs> maybe some bourbon, and uh, then we'll, we'll turn on the cameras and we'll start answering questions again, and uh, we'll, we'll see where that gets us. <laughs> hey, I'm looking forward to it, man. It's been a pleasure. Hey, man, you too. All right, guys, uh, as always, we appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for hanging out through the uh, through the technical difficulties. Um, you know, I, I think it was still broadcasting, but I want to make sure we cut the feed. Brought it back up. Malcolm, thanks for signing back in, brother. I definitely appreciate you doing that. But as always, guys, I'm Pitmaster Shane D. We're going to do this live as much as possible. We're trying to do it every week so you can answer, ask those questions direct to some of your heroes, man, guys like Malcolm. If there's people you want to see on the show that you want to get some more information from, ask those questions live and direct to. Let me know who they are. Email me, pitmaster at gorillagrills.com. I'd be happy to reach out to them. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, in the barbecue world. We all each other, you know, each other a favor. So don't be afraid to toss it out there. Darren Proctor, you're a guy that needs to get on this show. I just saw you in there, man. Uh, but we're gonna get a lot of people that you normally don't have access to here live and direct with Pitmaster Shane D and Gorilla Grills live, so you can ask those questions and we can just have that conversation about barbecue, about friends, about family, about whatever it is you're interested in. It's all about bringing the information straight to you. So that's it, folks. I'm Pitmaster Shane D. This is Gorilla Grills. We'll catch you next time.